Hi and welcome to St Ninian's Church in Stonehouse. My name is Stuart and I get to be the minister here. It's my great pleasure to welcome you from wherever you find yourself today. We're glad that you are able to join us and we appreciate that you've chosen to join us at this time. As always, if you find our service helpful, enjoyable or even inspiring, then we'd ask you to like and subscribe. Share what you've found with other people. Today our worship will be led by Michael Topol. Michael is a student on placement with us at the moment. Our prayers will be led later by Yvonne Hamilton. But let's listen to her son Blake as he brings our readings to us today. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verses 18 to 23 I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish? Yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labour under the sun. For a person may labour with wisdom, knowledge and skill, and then they must leave all they own to another who has not toiled for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labour under the sun? All their days their work is grief and pain. Even at night their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. Luke chapter 12 verses 13 to 21 Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out, be in your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. The encounter began like so many others. A man approached the rabbi and asked him to arbitrate a fairly common occurrence in that time and in that society. After all, the rabbi was influential. He was wise. He had the ear of God. This rabbi was different, though. He was not prepared to get involved with petty disputes about money. There were bigger forces at play here. Reading between the lines, we can surmise that the young man who approached Jesus was the younger brother, because according to the law of Deuteronomy, it was the eldest son who was to inherit the double portion of a father's estate. It was also the elder brother's decision whether to keep the estate altogether, or whether to share it with his family and kin. That's why throughout the Bible, When we see these kind of disputes, it's always the younger brother who is asking the question. Take, for example, the parable of the father with his two sons, which we heard a few weeks ago. It was the younger brother who asked for the inheritance. He was given one third of the estate, and the older brother would have had the rest. But why did Jesus respond in this way? After all, wasn't it his duty as a rabbi to get involved in these sorts of things? Isn't this what the people expected? Isn't this what the people needed? 
Throughout Jesus' ministry, we can see that he was less interested in the minutiae of legality, but rather in its overarching themes. He was less interested with the particular legalistic clauses that people could pull out, and more interested in the application of principles. Put simply, Jesus did not walk the earth as a lawyer, but as a preacher. His response always makes me laugh, and indeed, it's the only time that Jesus spoke to a questioner in this way. Man, he said, who made me judge? What's this to do with me? To exclaim old man is to show shock. Some people use the name of God to show how shocked they are. When I was at school, the trend was to shout, oh boy, in an American accent. Phrases like this make you look up and see what's going on. Jesus, hearing the question of the man in the crowd, wanted everybody to listen to what he was going to say next. Take care, and be on your guard against covetousness, says Jesus, showing that only a few seconds into the encounter he has already read the secrets of this man's heart and knows the real root of the request. Is this man asking because he has need? Or is he asking because he has greed? Clearly it was the latter that was driving this man to Jesus. He clearly felt that his life would only be worth living if he was to have a superfluity of things. The grass would be greener, his life would be better, if only he could have that one thing, that one thing that the law denied him. The parable that Jesus shares is fascinating, because it has 14, I counted them, occurrences of words such as I, me, my and mine. The man in the parable is obsessed with himself. There is no other character aside from God in the entire parable, and the only conversation that the man has is with himself. He is self-obsessed. He never sees beyond himself, let alone beyond the gate of his farm. He just does not see what's coming. We all know that one person, don't we? Of whom it can be said that he or she is a self-made woman who loves her maker. The one person who is obsessed with themselves and cannot see past the end of their nose. The man in his head faced a huge dilemma. What am I to do with all my wealth? What am I to do with all my grain? Woe is me, I've too much to store. Your heart cannot but help feel sorry for him, can it? Or perhaps it can. The man's dilemma is that he simply has too many good things. His life is full and so is his barn. The poor chap simply does not know what to do. So he makes a decision. He will plan ahead. He will raise a new, bigger barn. And there he will store his precious grain. His decision makes perfect economic sense, but is the very reverse of the Christian approach. He thinks that to hold on to his excess will lead him to happiness. But our encounters with Jesus show us that the way to happiness is rather to share our excess in love. Maybe you, like me, have read the newspaper headlines about those people who win the lottery. You see pictures of them holding the massive cheque and clinking their champagne flutes, dreaming of happiness ahead, who only years later are in the depths of despair. Maybe they've lost all their money. Maybe they've lost the ones that they loved. Those people may have dreamed of a big win on the pools for years, but they've realised that things aren't always better after the win. It would almost be better if they had never won at all. In a funny way, I suspect the same could be said of the rich man and his crops. It may have been better if they'd never grown as well. Growing up as a good Methodist, the rule of John Wesley was always drilled into me from an early age. The rule that we should earn all we can, save all we can, and give all we can. 
It's said that when he was a student, John Wesley lived on £28 a year and gave £2 away. Over time, though, his wealth increased. No longer just earning £30 a year, but £60, £90, £120. Yet he continued to live on £28 a year and just gave increasingly more away. He could not bear the thought of growing rich while those around him starved. When he was questioned, he exclaimed, I have two silver teaspoons in London and two at Bristol. This is all the silver plate which I have at present, and I shall not buy any more, while so many around me want for bread. Had our rich fool been drilled in the ways of John Wesley, perhaps the story would have turned out very differently. This desire to accumulate may begin very innocently. I need a roof over my head. I need a bed. I need a desk. I need a chair. All fairly innocent. Before long, this progresses to, I need a sofa. I need a television. I need a computer. Again, nothing particularly to see here. Then, I need a bigger television. I need a snazzier laptop. I need a faster car. Before long, the need ceases to be need and becomes want. But we do not recognise that the change has taken place. We continue to desire and feed on the desires, not on the items themselves. We end up never being happy with that which we've acquired, and we become obsessed with our next acquisition. The Romans had a proverb that money was like seawater. The more you drink it, the thirstier you become. If we were to live our lives like the rich fool, our happiness would drain as our thirst increased. Eventually we would lose all sense of reason. We would move away from the motto to be found on the American dollar in God We Trust, changing to in things or possession or staff or positions we trust in seeking to eat and drink and be merry, like the rich man, we would end up starving, thirsty and miserable. Not only did the fool never see beyond himself, but he never saw beyond this world. All of the plans he made, all of the thoughts he entertained, were based around his earthly life. They just did not include God or God's will. So with that in mind, there are some scenarios I'd like you to think about, questions or statements which relate to our Bible passage, but equally relate to the world in which we live. Here's the first one. There's a shortage of toilet paper. You have a few packets, which should last you a fair while, but you're thinking of getting some more, just in case. But should you? at the expense of those who may have none. Number two. Petrol prices are going up rapidly. You filled up your car recently, but you're considering filling some jerry cans in case the price goes up even further. But again, you know that stocks are limited. Number three. With the war in Ukraine continuing, your local supermarket is rationing bottles of cooking oil to two per person. You know that if you do a shop now, you could probably go back later and buy two more without them noticing. But should you? Number four. In Ireland, there is an extreme housing crisis. Because properties are being bought and left standing empty in order to drive up prices in the rental market. Is this unfair manipulation of the market? Or is this just business? In times of crisis, it is natural to put our trust in things, to want to make provision should things get any worse. And to an extent, that's fairly wise. After all, just giving up or burying our heads in the sand or leaving things to the wind is hardly fending for ourselves. But there comes a time where God tells us to place not our trust in the things of earth, but rather in him and him alone. 
There will be times when barns full of crops will be of no use. There may come a time when a bank account full of sterling will buy us nothing. There may come a time when even those who have hoarded will find their hoard to be worthless. Jesus tells us the parable of the rich fool to teach us against greed. He emphasises that a secure life does not depend upon possessions, but upon entrusting one's life to God. The scenario that Jesus predicts shows a vastly wealthy landholder who had an abundant harvest and decided to tear down his current storage facilities to make room for larger ones. The rich man is a shrewd businessman, but his shrewdness is evil. By building colossal storage, the rich fool decides to hoard his harvest and not to contribute to the market with his surplus. His intentions could well affect the food supply or create a scarcity of grain, ultimately driving the price up. All the better for him. The farmer is only interested in his well-being, ignoring the needs of the poor peasants around him, who could be so greatly affected by his actions. The parable describes a self-centred farmer who makes an unethical profit and who ultimately harms the economy. By hoarding his grain, the rich fool secures his economic power and position of status in the village, as others are made more and more dependent on him. Perhaps the rich fool wants to control the market at the expense of his neighbours. Perhaps he's just not thinking about anyone but himself. Ultimately, the wealthy farmer is a fool because he assumes that his security depends on his own possessions and wealth, and not on God, the source of all gifts and security. God demands his soul when the fool invites himself to be merry and enjoy wealth. In a single moment, all his hopes vanish. God asks him a rhetorical question, and the things you've prepared, whose will they be? God's question reveals that he cannot take his hoarded grain to the grave, nor does he know whose they will be. Perhaps his children or his poor peasants, from whom he withheld the grain in the first place, may take them. Maybe they'll be left to rot in their magnificent barn, a memorial to a man who would not share, a man who trusted in the wrong things, a man who gave in to greed. Greed is the very antithesis of Christianity. It is the canker, the, the worm, which sadly nestles itself inside us all. It is the teaching of a sin-laden world that we would be so much happier if, that we would be so much more content if only, dot dot dot. Friends, God did not make us for this, yet the temptation is there nonetheless. It affects me, it affects you, it guides our actions, even if we're not aware of it. It makes us worry for the future instead of trusting in God, who as Christians we claim holds the future. Greed destroys us. It destroys society. It destroys relationships. It destroys all it touches. We all know the story of Midas and his love for gold, don't we? The man who longed for gold so much that his wish was granted and everything he touched turned into gold. Only when he went to touch a loved one did he regret his wish. His greed had overtaken his love. His greed meant that he could never have love. But friends, this is not the end of the story. Yes, greed may destroy, greed may despair, but there is more. For just as greed does all these things, generosity does the opposite. Generosity blesses us, blesses our neighbours, ultimately blesses our communities and our world. As Jesus himself says only a few chapters earlier in the Gospel according to Luke, Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use it will be measured back to you. Our possessions do nothing to guarantee our happiness or security in the future. All that we have, all that we have earned, can be gone in an instant. 
Our currencies can nosedive. Our food can spoil. Our technology can die and our learning can be disproven. The only thing that will abide forever is God and his love. But such is the topsy-turvy nature of God, that even if we really want to hoard God's love, the only way that we can really be full of it is if we give it away to others. When we do this, we will see that, without our recognising it, we have become full of the Holy Spirit, and are abounding with joy. So, friends, in this time of great uncertainty, in this time when so much is in the air and so little is secure, this time when the cost of cooking oil is rising by the minute and we need a small mortgage to afford even a pound of butter, let us not fall into the trap of hoarding that which will not last, but instead seek God and his kingdom. And let us remember the words of the proverb. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched. And one who waters himself will himself be watered.
God of all, who sees past human distinction, who cherishes our uniqueness and our similarities. We bring to you our prayers for others and ourselves. As the pandemic continues, as poverty ravages, as the climate crisis destroys, we pray for our world and for all those seeking new ways to bring your peace and your justice. Help each of us to have the strength to change our ways, to care more, to love more, and to be better protectors of your creation, both our fellow people and the environment. As people in our country and our community struggle with all the challenges that this time brings, we pray for all those feeling lost or alone, all those who go without, all those grieving and all those hoping for a better tomorrow. Help each of us to bring hope, love and the joyous light of Jesus to all whom we meet. As our church continues to change and adapt, as we begin this new journey together, we pray for this congregation and this parish. Help each of us to have wisdom and happiness as we continue to find ways to do your work in this place and time. In silence, we each bring to you the prayers in our own hearts. God of all, as we dedicate ourselves once more to your service, we pray for ourselves. Help each of us to have the boldness to continue, the grace to forgive, and the sight to see your love in our lives and in our world, this day and every day. Hear these our prayers, Lord, as we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Called by God, known by name, sharers in his inheritance, we go with his blessing. The God who is known to us as Father, Son and Holy Spirit, whose blessing is with us this day and always. Thank you.